everyone, it's Simon Kay Watson. I'm a research associate in um, Manchester Urban Institute as well, and I sit in the geography department. And so I'm going to speak to you about Pokemon Beers, which Jeremy led into the university at the end of this presentation. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about uh, the university's wellbeing strategy, what the university is doing on this in terms of its campus, its living campus plan. Um, and then I'm going to switch over and look a bit more at the sort of research context, I guess, talk you through why it's important to understand the health wellbeing impacts of green space in the buildings, um, and then show you a little bit of the research that I've been doing in, in collaboration with the Living Campus Plan as well. So, um, wellbeing strategy was published um, at the start of this academic year. It's available online if you want to have a look at it. But you can see the vision is to create a university environment where every member of our community is supported to feel good and function well. And then if you look at the first objective, um, this is the first kind of practical step to really influencing this strategy, and it's about the Manchester Ways to Wellbeing. So these are six Ways to Wellbeing that Manchester has identified. Um, these are based on research by the New Economics Foundation, which is a think tank in London. Um, so they did some research to look at how we can improve people's mental, ca mental capital and mental well-being, um, and they produced five ways to well-being, um, and their evidence suggests that even quite small improvements to people's well-being can have quite big implications for their mental health, um, to really help people flourish in their daily lives. So the university has added Be Healthy to these to produce the six Manchester ways to well-being. So these are quite practical steps that we can all think about and maybe take if we want to improve our well-being. You can see here in a bit more detail, we've got connect, that's about social connection, connecting to people, making the time to do that. Be active, so going outside, going for a walk, going for a run, just going for a walk at lunchtime, or maybe getting off the bus a few stops earlier. Um, take notice, so actually take a bit of time to be mindful about what we're doing. Take notice of um, our walking to uni, perhaps. Um, learn and discover, so really um, continuing to expand our horizons and getting kind of meaningful um, elements from that. Give, which is um, about doing something for other people, so it might be something as simple as just saying thank you for something, or it could actually be um, volunteering some of your time or doing something that gives you that sort of sense of purpose. And then finally, the Manchester's edition of Be Healthy, so actually taking care of ourselves, making sort of healthy decisions um, around food, but also in terms of um, taking time off, balancing our work, um, our uh, work life balance, that kind of thing. So that's the Manchester way to our being. The um, Manchester Wellbeing Strategy feeds into the Campus Master Plan. So this is a £1 billion 10-year plan from 2012 to 2022 to develop a world-class single campus for students and staff. So we've all seen all the building work going on across the campus. So this is um, where that feeds into to create a single campus. Um, and then as part of this, um, Helen mentioned the Living Campus Plan. So I believe this will be available online very soon. But um, to give you a bit of a kind of brief overview to this, so this is about um, delivering a living campus which is distinctive with a sense of place where we can learn, work, enjoy, reflect and live and where we work alongside nature and nature works alongside us. So this means um, a core part of this is investing in quality green space and green infrastructure on campus where we've got room to learn, to think, to connect with nature um, so this will have both preventative and restorative health impacts, um, give us opportunities to exercise, to be active, but also just to observe nature and just immerse ourselves in these green spaces. Um, it will produce that natural resilience that Jeremy has talked to us about. Also will support biodiversity and give us space, habitats and pathways for, um, for wildlife. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about, various um, different types of green infrastructures, so trees, different sort of spaces, we've got um, potential sites for wild, wild flowers, we've got some edge planting to the campus, but then also these avenue um, sites, so trees um, and green lakes for wildlife. So this hopefully is what our campus will look like by 2022. But what the Living Campus Plan really tries to draw out is that the, um, the public realm is not just about the space between buildings, it's more than that. So um, really viewing it as a valuable resource, um, something that we can um, promote the natural side and really allow students and staff to, um, to prosper, to flourish and to um, get that full range of benefits. So that's giving you a bit of a, an overview in terms of what the university 
is doing in, in this area, but then to move on to the kind of more research side and actually understanding how do we look at the impact that our public realm and our buildings are having on people's <coughs> health and well-being. So to start off then with some killer facts, we know that 68% of men and 58% of women in the UK are overweight or obese. The cost of this is £900 million a year to the NHS due to physical inactivity. There's 37,000 avoidable deaths in the UK um, if we just increase physical activity levels. And that doesn't mean you know, high-impact sport, that means just walking to work perhaps, that kind of thing. And we know that 21% of children now play outdoors, whereas for their parents that figure was 71%. I think that's really shocking, that statistic really sort of brings it home. We also know that city dwellers are 40% more likely to, su to suffer from depression, 20% more likely to suffer from anxiety, and twice as likely to, to develop schizophrenia. So this is due to what's known as sensory overload. So our cities have quite overwhelming stimuli in terms of noise, sight, smells, sounds, density and crowding, pollution, and all of these things um, can create something called urban psychosis. And, um, Studies have found that children that grow up next to a busy road are much more likely to develop urban psychosis than children that don't, so it really does have very real health impacts. But this means there are some really um, significant opportunities for urban design to tr try and tackle these problems. So previously, in the past, when we think about health in terms of urban design, it tends to be health and safety, so how design might cause injury, how it might cause illness, and how we stop that. Whereas more recently, we're really starting to think about health in more active ways, so how can we actively promote wellness and activity levels in our cities? Of course, there's not going to be one um, solution to this. It's going to be lots of small, practical steps on the ground that will add up to um, start to tackle these issues. So we've already um, heard quite a lot about green infrastructure and green spaces, and this is clearly a really important part of trying to tackle um, health and wellbeing issues in cities. So um, both in terms of making sure they're accessible, so everyone can use them, that everyone feels safe to use them, they're easily accessible just as part of our daily lives, so actually thinking about how you plan that into site so that you don't have to go out of their way to find green spaces. Um, but then also thinking about the infrastructure side, if you want to boost activity levels, making sure that you've got pedestrian walkways, you've got cycle routes, and these kind of things will really promote people using them. Um, and then we also know that trying to um, create pro-social spaces will really boost people's well-being as well. So including that kind of social element within green spaces is really important. Um, so as well as the physical benefits, we also know that green spaces have mental um, well-being benefits. And we, we all know that we feel good when we spend time in nature, but why is that? So there's three main theories here. So we've got biophilia theory. Um, so this was from Edward Wilson, who was um, a US American um, biologist. And um, this theory is that humans have an innate need to be in touch with nature and in touch with other species. So by spending time in green spaces is one way that we can fulfill that need and uh, we feel better as a result of that. Um, stress reduction theory. This um, is Roger Ulrich's theory, who is a professor of architecture in the US. And this is about, and by connecting with nature and spending time in green spaces and away from our daily demands, we have to reduce our stress levels. And then attention restoration theory is um, from Stephen and Rachel Kaplan, who are environmental psychologists. And this is the idea that we, nature gets our attention, but it doesn't need the same amount of concentration that we need in non-natural spaces. So therefore, it has that kind of restful um, impact for us, and we feel rested after spending time in nature. So it's probably a combination of all of these theories is why we get these, um, these mental benefits from spending time in green spaces. There's also opportunities for building design um, in terms of trying to tackle health and well-being issues. So we actually spend 90% of our time indoors, whether that's in buildings or in cars, buses, public transport, getting to and from buildings, essentially. So you can see the significant um, implications if you can try and make small benefits to the way we design um, our buildings, that will have a real, real impact on people. Um, so some of the ways that our um, built environment can impact on us, I'm just going to take you through quite quickly. One of them is about indoor air quality. So um, the air that we breathe, the kind of particulates that are in there, it might be things related to dust, cigarette smoke, cooking, pets, 
mould, all of these things have a real impact on how we feel when we're inside building. And um, ventilation is so important to make sure that we, we do feel fresh, we do feel good when we're inside. You can see there's some, um, some sort of health symptoms and issues that can be caused by poor indoor air quality or poor ventilation. Thermal comfort is another one, so how um, we feel temperature-wise in buildings. Um, this can be just looking at different seasons or different times of day, but also thinking about different groups of people, so maybe age and gender really impacts on how our sort of own thermal comfort preferences, I guess. So we know that um, an environment that might be comfortable for men is quite often too cold for women, things like that. So it's quite important one to understand if we really want to make sure everyone feels comfortable inside. Um, daylighting with lighting is really important. So um, trying to make the most of natural light, natural daylight. Um, we know that if people um, spend all day with no natural light, they actually struggle to sleep that night and they will get about 30 minutes less sleep as a result of that at least. So it does have very real implications um, on people's circadian rhythms. And then obviously making sure that if we've got um, an overcast day, we also have sufficient lighting within the building to make up for that, making sure there's no glare issues, that it's, it's comfortable for everyone and doesn't impact on people. Acoustics and noise, so we all know how irritating it is when you've got all this sort of external noise outside that's impacting what you're trying to do um, inside. So um, traffic, planes, weather noise, but then also noise within the building. So it might be the actual um, mechanical systems of that building, it might be other building users, and just the acoustics of that building haven't been designed properly to sort of eliminate that. Um, we know that children that sit at the back of the class um, can hear significantly less well than children that sit on the front row, and they have to concentrate a lot more to be able to get the same um, amount of information, I guess, out of their lessons. So, again, it has real um, implications on people's well-being on their educational attainment. Interior layout and active design. So in terms of layout, this has um, a real impact on how much people move during the day, um, whether you're going to get up from your desk and move around, how often you're going to go and get a drink of water even, so how, how hydrated you stay. Um, also impacts whether you're more likely to bump into other people just during the course of, the, of your day and have a chat. So that social connection side is really important um, to think through interior layout. And then active design, so where are the lifts in comparison to the stairs? Is it easy to find the stairs or they tucked around the back? Um, thinking about different types of furniture options. Can you give people people um, breakout spaces so they can get up and move away from their desk? Can you give them things like um, adaptable desks so they can stand up part of the day? All of these things have real health impacts. Biophilia and views, so we know what biophilia is. Um, you see lots of plants in one image, and then the one on the bottom right, this is called Savannah Theory, where you include um, architecture that is similar to um, kind of tree like environments. It's, again, it's something that um, humans are known to really kind of connect with, it makes us feel good to be in those sort of spaces. So there's a lot of this, these kind of ideas trying to bring those shapes into architecture. Um, and then views outside is another really important factor. Um, we all know that we like to have the desk by the window, we all know that the desk by the window is view of the tree is the best one, but why? Um, and again, Roger Ulrich, one of the theorists from before, um, he, he found that um, hospital patients with a view outside of the natural environment actually heal quicker as a result of that. So again, real, real impact, scientifically validated impact. And then look and feel, so this is getting towards the interior design side of things. So, um, you know, you guys know, you, you can probably work out which of the environments appeals most to you. So actually personality comes into this as well, the kind of environment that we feel comfortable in. You see something quite homey versus something quite sterile or quite techy. And then the two at the bottom that are bringing in um, natural plants and vegetation, but in quite different ways. The one's quite high end, one's a bit more, I guess, bog standard, a bit more homey. And again, we'll kind of prefer one or the other. And this is really important for how we feel, especially in spaces where we feel comfortable, whether we feel able to socialise or not, whether we can be ourselves. And then finally, actually the location of the building and whether you've got access to local amenities. So um, do you have to drive in or can you walk? Is it accessible? Um, can you pop out at lunchtime and buy some healthy food or are you on a business park and there's no way you don't have access to anything like that? So all of these things play into our health and well-being in, in buildings. You can see we've got our set of eight facts that we've talked through, and then on the end we've got employee engagement. So this is where we start to think about how do we really understand and measure the impact of these things on people. And um, so that's where the employee engagement side comes in. Um, there are, 
it's such an important area, and yet actually there's very little research that's been done on how buildings impact on people. There's no legislative drivers to make designers or developers actually measure the strong impact that buildings have on people. They don't need to find out whether people like that building, how people feel in that building, how it impacts on them. Um, and yet, it's, you know, it has huge impact on people. Um, one way for interested developers to do this is called post occupancy evaluation. So once a building is completed and occupied, people um, go and do some kind of evaluation activity. It would tend to be looking at these kind of factors, so actually looking at the performance of the building. Again, how do you really know the impact of that on people if you're already measuring the building? You need to be measuring the people and their outcomes, the things they experience, if you really want to understand that. So there is, there is a real gap in the market. So how do we measure the impact on people to then learn about that to then be able to inform the next of design. So we all know that we feel good in certain spaces. We all know our favourite building or our favourite space within that building where we like to spend time, see friends, be on our own. But why is that? How do we learn about that? How do we actually understand that relationship? And this totally applies to green spaces as well, the public realm. Again, we all know the kind of green spaces that we like to be in, but how do we learn about what works for people and then you take that learning forward. So the challenge then is actually measuring people. It's difficult. People are difficult to measure. In the past, um, from the sort of late 1990s through to the early 2000s, this is called design quality. So um, it's that intangible impact that our environments have. How do you actually try and understand that? Like, it's something that's difficult to capture. So it's a people-centered way of looking at buildings, and it's about that non-expert knowledge. We're all experts in how we feel, so that's the knowledge that we want, that sort of experience. And then more recently, the growth of the health and wellbeing agenda has um, really kind of brought this into the spotlight again. Um, it's very much tied to productivity gains, so um, making people feel good to then function well, that um, is tied to um, productivity, but also educational attainment in university settings. So um, it's very applicable to different building types. And then we get language like the business case for well-being. And Jeremy was talking about valuation and the value of green infrastructure. So exactly the same kind of ideas coming through. And actually, this is quite an accessible um, way of looking at buildings. You don't have to be a building designer or a building expert to have an opinion to understand this, to get involved. Um, and it's something that's quite affirmative. It's not about saying to people, you need to reduce your energy use, and therefore you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. It's actually saying, look, we can make people feel amazing in your buildings, and therefore they're going to do better for you. It's a, it's a kind of easy sell. It's easy to get people on board with it. So this um, infographic kind of really brings that point home about the business case um, for wellbeing. So this is showing that actually for a typical business, only 1% of their costs per year are due to energy. 90% are due to their staff. So you can imagine if we invest in quite modest changes in the workplace, and that has quite modest improvements in people's well-being. Incrementally, that will add up to be a really significant return on investment. So that's why there's so much interest in well-being at the moment from the sort of commercial sector. But exactly the same thing applies again in university buildings. If you invest in, in people-friendly environments, that is going to pay back in terms of um, students learning better, concentrating better, and um, perhaps going to pay back in academic research outputs, these kind of things. So um, if we actually want to try and measure the impact of buildings and of our green spaces on people, we really need to understand what we mean by well-being. Um, it's quite a catch-all term. It's similar to sustainability now, it's used by a lot of people to mean a lot of different things. Um, in terms of the built environment, well-being has been used quite synonymously with health, so even with the title of this presentation, it's about health and well-being. So um, both physical health and mental health often in terms of well-being. It's often used in terms of comfort, so indoor environmental conditions, and actually normally to do with lack of problems. It's not actively trying to make people feel better, it's more about um, preventing there being any issues with the building, and that seems to be to well being. And then more recently, there's a lot of talk about happiness, so happy places, happy spaces, happy buildings. And so this is related to aesthetics and beauty and design and how that makes people feel. So if we look at this from a kind of broader social science perspective, this is what's known as subjective or hedonic well-being. Um, it's about positive feelings or a lack of negative feelings, um, giving people pleasurable experiences, but it's actually quite superficial. It's about fleeting kind of experiences, fleeting happiness. 
if we really want to try and tie well-being to the productivity um, agenda, then we probably need to go into it a bit further to really try and make that link a bit better. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to push towards that flourishing um, side of the scale. We want people to feel good and therefore function well. Um, so in my um, research, I've tried to develop um, a definition for eudaimonic well-being. So this is, rather than hedonic, eudaimonic is about having a purpose in life, having a meaningful life. Um, it's going beyond that kind of fleeting idea of well-being. So um, through reading about what has been done in buildings and the built environment so far, I've come up with a definition for this. So it would be made up of um, five components, two of which are satisfaction and effect. The satisfaction is about um, kind of cognitive evaluations, about um, goal accomplishment. Effect is a psychological term. It's basically happiness. It means positive feelings and lack of negative feelings. And those two things together is normally how we measure hedonic well-being. But then to understand this more kind of psychological definition, we have three psychological components. So competence, which is about um, people's ability to um, get on with the task at hand. And relatedness, which is about social connection and social ties, belonging. And autonomy, which is about personal control and feeling in control of what we're doing and where we are. So if we take that as our definition for well-being, um, how do we go about measuring it? Um, so again, in my research, I've developed um, a scale, multi-item scale, to try and measure this construct of well-being in the built environment. So um, the, the various items are based on those, those five components. Um, and then you can see it's just rated by people on a five-point scale. It gives you a really quick, cost-effective, non-expert way of measuring well-being in buildings. Anyone, anyone can fill it out. Anyone can, can um, carry out this survey. It gives you that really quick quantitative score, which is very transferable. People will listen to that sort of information. Um, so this has been piloted in non-clinical healthcare buildings, in commercial offices, and also in the higher education sector and the university. Um, so it's been piloted and validated using RASH modelling, but um, we're now rolling it out to basically more buildings, more of these types of buildings, to gather more data to make sure that it is, number one, it is working, and number two, sort of prove that it's useful. Um, but it was this scale that we used to start to think about how we could understand the impact of the living campus plan going forward. So um, just changing the wording slightly, so it was about the campus as opposed to buildings, we, over the summer, just gone, we um, sent this out electronically to a representative sample of PSS and academic staff, and then it went out through various student channels to students as well um, over the summer. Um, and then the data that came back in, showed us that as a sort of bench line score, so before the actual living campus plan started to be implemented, um, you can see we've got these kind of global level wellbeing scores for each group of people. Um, so interesting, but at this point that's a bit out of context. It will be more useful when we can see that over time as we start to monitor. Hopefully they will start going up. But then it also means that because the scale is based on five components of wellbeing, we can split the data down. Um, and it means that you can see, so for example, PSS staff on the left, um, I've got quite consistent scores across all five sort of domains. But then if you go to the far side with undergraduate students, there's a lot of difference in the way they, their well-being is being scored. Um, so a really high autonomy score, which probably says something about undergraduate students really enjoying their sort of independence, um, they feel in control of what they're doing, um, the campus is really sort of facilitating them to do that and be independent. But then their relatedness score is really quite low. So that sort of social connection and feeling of belonging is quite low. I think that's really interesting. Immediately, this is only a sort of benchmark um, measure, but immediately telling us something quite interesting about our students and how perhaps we can, we can help them in the future. So again, this will be, as we continue to monitor, we'll be able to see how these things change. Um, so then finally, um, going back to the Living Campus Plan, you can see that there's um, targets. So based on the work that we've done, we've got um, some well-being kind of scores, some well-being values based on these um, this data as well. So we'll continue to monitor this over the next five years to see how this goes. Um, so like I said, long-term monitoring the plan, looking at staff and student scores, but also looking at return on investment data, saying how do we prove the value that we've invested in people-friendly, student-friendly <coughs> um, campus environments, and how does that return in terms of people's well-being, perhaps even thinking about productivity and sort of educational attainment as well. So finally then, your well-being is important. Um, 
such an up and coming area and it's certainly not going to go away. Um, I think there's lots of very practical things we can all do, so from looking at the, the Manchester Waste World being a great place to start. Um, if you are interested in this general area, area there's another um, event on two weeks today which is looking at health and wellbeing in smart cities. So if you've got an interest in this and the role that technology plays, that might be a really interesting event to go to. So if you just have a Google, you'll be able to find it. So health and wellbeing in smart cities. Um, yeah, thank you.